Okay. All right. Now let's move you, on. Do you need to, to do the the first part all over? Can or we can do? You? Can we do that one again? Is that all right? Yeah, we can. Okay. I won't be able to repeat exactly what I said before. That's fine. That's Just the way it goes. All right. Mm -hmm. So I'm Vince Cerf, Google's chief internet evangelist. My name is spelled V I N T C E R F. Excellent. Do you want me to repeat the first question? No, that's okay. The okay. question is, uh, what happens when we double the world's internet population from two billion to four billion? Okay. We may already be there because I don't think any of the estimates include the number of people using internet-enabled mobiles. I can't even guess at how many are internet enabled. We know there are 5.5 billion in the world. Probably 20% are, uh, are internet enabled, but some of those may be owned by people who are already counted in the 2 billion online, so I really don't know. Uh, but the side effect of increasing the number of people on the net uh, has both positive and negative characteristics to it. First positive one is that it increases the amount of uh, utility that the net has because the probability that the person you want to interact with is online goes up as more people are actually part of the system. It also increases the total amount of information in the network because the, everybody who gets on the net seems to generate as well as consume information so that makes the life harder for Google and Yahoo and Microsoft and others who are indexing all this stuff. Uh, this actually drives uh, a problem for uh, users, especially if they're involved in social networking, because the number of participants in that social network per user goes up. And eventually that translates into too many interactions and transactions to keep up with. Google Plus uh, made an attempt to um, give a little bit of control to the users by having circles so that you could identify uh, groups of friends or associates and then deal only with the transactions particular to that group. Of course, one person could be in more than one group. Uh, so there's a positive benefit, though, to increasing the number of people on the net because the um, network effect of being able to carry out transactions with people who are online increases when there is a high probability that they'll be there. So I think that the technical tools will arise uh, for, uh, for coping with this increased volume of content. I know that email has been a help to me in that regard because people send me emails drawing my attention to things on the net that I didn't know about and might not even have looked for. So in a sense I have a collection of editors who are drawing on my behalf or drawing my, my attention to various things. So we will find ways of coping with information overload. Mm -hmm. With mobile connectivity, many of us are living a life that is always on or hyper-connected. Some people even say the internet is an extension of our brains and we are becoming cyborgs, human computer beings. How does being connected online all the time change us as humans? So uh, this notion of always online has been a popular rubric. I don't think we're really exactly always online in the sense of constantly interacting, but having the capability to be online whenever you want to is very powerful. For all practical purposes, if you carry an internet-enabled mobile with you, you have an information window in your hip on your hip pocket or in your purse, which reaches out to the full resources of the entire internet and the World Wide Web. So uh, that changes everything because now you get information then when you know you need it, as opposed to trying to remember that you need to get it later or go to the library and go through the card catalog and find the book. So it, it rapidly facilitates access to information. It also rapidly facilitates our ability to communicate with other people. We don't have to wait till we get to a place where there's a telephone because you have one in your hand. Mm -hmm. Capturing what's going on around you, either because you want to remember it or you want to share it, is easier if you have a mobile that has a video camera, an audio recorder, and so on, mm -hmm. plus the ability to upload that stuff into the net. So, I don't really consider this to be a cyborg situation at all, but I do see it as a powerfully enabling capability that lets us interact in the online world whenever we want to. In 2015, when most people generally go directly to the World Wide Web to do their work, shopping, socializing, and other online activities, as they have the past 20 years, or will most people generally be using apps or social networks as their gateways for doing everything? Which will dominate most people's lives online, the open web or apps and social networks? See, I believe that uh, it's a false dichotomy to believe that the open web and apps uh, in the mobiles are in fact competing with each other. If you look in any detail at an application running on a mobile, it's reaching out into the internet in order to get access to content and it often uses the web uh, protocols in order to do that. 
So this is, I don't believe that, uh, that one should imagine that these are competing with each other. Uh, it's, in fact, uh, without the World Wide Web, the mobile would not be very interesting. So uh, I don't see this as a, as a dichotomy at all. As to initial portals, it, that's going to vary. There are people who will have access to the internet principally through a mobile. A lot of the developing world has taken that path because the economics drive it that way. Okay. Now it's possible the economics will eventually uh, reach the point where getting a laptop or a notebook or something else will be um, just as easily accomplished as getting a, a mobile. Um, however, there are other parts of the world that have uh, grown up not so much with the mobiles initially, but with laptops, desktops, portable devices. And I think the two are complementary. There are times when you really want a large screen area in order to see what it is that's being presented, and you don't get that uh, without having a bigger device than a mobile. What's funny about the mobiles is eventually they may have the ability to detect other devices in their local area. So imagine, for example, you walk into a hotel room your mobile discovers that there's a high-definition display in the room and it's accessible by local radio. Maybe it's Wi-Fi or something else. Mm -hmm. That means that the mobile no longer has to rely only on its own small uh, presentations area. It can send what it wanted to show you to this large-scale mm -hmm. television set or it could instruct the television, assuming it's internet enabled too, <clears throat> to go download something or display something off the net. So the mobile now becomes and an instrument in conjunction with other devices in the local area that serve your needs as opposed to imagining that you only have an interaction with the laptop or only have an interaction with the, uh, the mobile. We use multiple internet enabled devices concurrently in order to achieve our objectives. Okay. What responsibilities do technology innovators and designers and the organizations that produce our tools and access have to ethically serving the global public, and are they living up to them? In, uh, in engineering, uh, especially mechanical engineering or civil engineering, a certified civil engineer undertakes uh, to build buildings that are safe and, in fact, has some liability if they prove not to be. We don't have that same liability in the software world, and it's arguable whether we should or not. Part of the reason for this is that it's hard to write software that doesn't have bugs. Um, and, and having a liability for the existence of a bug is uh, a, a pretty tough challenge and it might cause people to not want to write software anymore. On the other hand, some kinds of software are so important that you want people to feel a sense of liability. Example, medical instruments that are uh, controlled by software. It, you want to be pretty confident that there aren't any bugs that would have serious and potentially fatal effects. Uh, security is another example where um, the loss of privacy or confidentiality or loss of identity or all kinds of other losses of data um, are a result of poorly constructed software. And of course in the United States where everybody can sue anybody, uh, you may be liable even if there wasn't any uh, statutory liability or if you offered a piece of software and said it's uh, no guarantees. Uh, you could still get sued in the United States anyway. I think, however, that we would do well to train programmers in the ethic of trying to minimize the bugs that are in the software and think carefully about how the design works, how to build software that is resistant to various forms of attack. I think there's a real responsibility there. One thing which I have uh, found to be controversial is that I think we should teach programmers who are writing applications for the internet more about how applications can be attacked. So they need to know what the attack vectors are. They need to know, you know, what's a, how do you build a virus or a worm or uh, a Trojan horse? And, and we actually show them how to build these things and then challenge them to build more to attack each other's software. The, some people say, oh my God, you're teaching hacking terrorists. The real answer is, unless you know how your software could be attacked, you won't know how to defend against it. So I think there's an obligation in the software, computer science, and academic world to actually teach people how to defend against these things. It's like reading Harry Potter and defense against the dark arts. <laughs> Will IGF survive and still be relevant in 2015? Explain. 
I believe that IGF will in fact continue to be uh, relevant for quite a long time to come, well past 2015, and the reason is that the internet is evolving. The elements that of the, its ecosystem keep growing. Uh, new functional capabilities keep coming along, and every time that happens there are new kinds of issues that have to be dealt with. And that I, I think of internet governance as a very, very broad topic. It's not simply how do we deal with domain names and internet address allocation? It is the entire ecosystem of participants, the products, the services, the institutions, the private sector, the government, the non and NGOs, and, and the general public, civil society, all are part of that ecosystem. And understanding how all those parts are interacting with each other, what risks exist, uh, what liabilities, what benefits, is the subject of discussion in the IGF. I think that we can still work to make the IGF more effective and make it more relevant. And some ways to do that might involve more outreach to other institutions that are part of the Internet ecosystem or are adjacent to it. A small example is the World Trade Organization, which specifically deals primarily with trade negotiation and treaties and agreements. But the Internet is in, is, has become infused into that whole uh, online commerce environment and therefore decisions about what's allowed and what is not uh, are going to have uh, relevance to the Internet Governance Forum discussions. So I don't see uh, any likelihood that IGF will have exhausted its utility by 2015 or beyond. What is your greatest hope for the future of the Internet? Well, I hope that everybody on the planet finally gets online and feels free and safe to share information, to carry out transactions on the net, to interact with their friends and their family. That only will happen if we really pay attention to building more secure and safer software, uh, put into place um, regimes that allow multilateral agreements on fighting crime uh, and abuse and harm in the net. And that can only work if uh, there are reciprocal arrangements among countries to A, agree on what kinds of things are abusive and B, what steps can be taken to cope with the problem. This may involve identifying a, per a perpetrator in one country who is harming a person in another one. And the international boundary creates a challenge for treaty-like arrangements. And all those things have to happen if we are going to have a network which we all want to live in and use. Mm -hmm. What is your greatest fear or concern for the future of the Internet? I worry that uh, the forces of abuse will overwhelm our ability to defend either on technical grounds or, or on uh, law enforcement and other, uh, other uh, mechanisms for, um, for coping with abuse. However, I'm impressed with the fact that the net has been in commercial operation for almost 20 years now. And it, despite the fact that there's a very heavy focus right now on security and safety, uh, people seem to have found ways to cope. So this is not just a matter of technology and it's not just a matter of legal regimes, it's also a matter of thoughtful use of the net, teaching people what's risky behavior and what is not, uh, teaching people to update their software on a regular basis. Those are all things that we can use to make the network a place to uh, be or a place to be in uh, that we actually feel confident in. Mm -hmm. Last question. Describe the future of the Internet in 10 seconds. It's going to get faster. It will be in more places and accessible all around the world. It will go off the planet because there's an interplanetary extension that's already in prototype operation. And it will probably become part of an interstellar mission that will probably be uh, mounted sometime in the 2030 range. Perfect. Well, that's all the questions I have. Okay, that's great.